fire this up. Shaky Grace piano set. Just all keys. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to play every song because you don't want to know how to play keys. Sure, <laughs> dude. Yeah, we'll just Just playing one, man. Yeah. We'll have to go through Build the a rig, rig full of your liking. Three times we mentioned it. The first few tours I did, it was just me solo and a shitty little Toyota Corolla, which was fun, but it was like wildly exhausting. You know, you just drive all day, all night, and then you'd, you'd get to the spot and play a show and then try and find a couch to sleep on. And it had a certain bit of romanticism to it, but for the most part, it was, <laughs> it was pretty treacherous. Eventually, when things started to pick up momentum, um, everything just kind of doubled in size. You know, the distance between shows changed and uh, the shows themselves got more intense. And as always, it just became clear that um, I needed help in my life. You know, I, I couldn't do it all by myself. And the only person that I could even imagine spending all that time in a vehicle with was my oldest and best friend in the world, Wesley Stewart. Him and I have been inseparable since he was in first grade and I was in second grade. And I, I mean, I just love this dude more than I can even process. And so, you know, I approached him and was like, hey man, you, what if we just go on this crazy road trip and uh, you help me drive and sell merch and and we'll make a little money and see how it goes. And he was like, yeah, all right. That was the beginning of some of the best years of my life, honestly. I upgraded from my Corolla to this big E250 conversion van that Wesley and I named Bessie. And Bessie, Wesley, and I just chased tour buses around the United States. Um, Bessie had a bed in the back and, and we would store the gear underneath the bed and we would just uh, play shows and sleep in Walmart parking lots and go bowling. And we really just saw America together in all of its weird splendor. I mean, we did crazy shit. Like we, we did a drive from Rhode Island to Portland, Oregon without stopping. It was like 36 straight hours where you go full psychedelic and start seeing like imaginary panthers on the road. And <laughs> you know, I was always able to trust my dude Wesley in these insane situations because we've been behind the wheel together since, you know, before we even had our driver's licenses. It's unbelievable. I can never thank him enough because I wouldn't have ever made it through any of that without him, you know? Eventually, uh, Boo and Pat joined, so the squad got bigger, and we decided to upgrade to a rental Sprinter van. At that point, that Sprinter was like, that, that was kind of max capacity. You know, it was always hairy getting from show to show, 
You're zooming down the road in this giant vehicle filled with all of your dearest friends and worldly possessions, just praying that you don't become some sort of statistic. And the dream is just hopefully to finally make it to a bus. I would go on friends' buses and it was like, wow, this is like a house. You actually get to sleep in a bed in this giant metal machine and and you get to place all your faith in, in a bus driver where you're like, hey, don't kill us. I'm gonna go hang out in the back. And there's a certain amount of peace of mind that comes with all that. The, but the thing that you trade in is being in control. You're no longer in control of that steering wheel. You're a passenger. Dun, dun, dun. So look alive. Oh, dude. I can't, I can't wait for like waking up and like turning to my right and like opening my bunk and it's your camera waiting for me. <laughs> Come with me, I'll give you a tour. So we got the back lounge, which you are a part of. Just the towel, back lounge towel, very important. Um, this is my bunk. This is where all my magic happens. It smells good right now. I have this paper bag, it's all my toiletries. Up here, you get a little more headroom. So if you have a nightmare in the middle of the night, you can go in. <gasps> come on, come on. It's this great mustard color. Come a little further. Oh, yeah. Here we go, we got the, uh, the, the uh, hive mind. This is actually Alejandro planted his brain AI unit, and this does all the thinking for him and most of the singing. Not all, but most. Right. I drive the bus. <laughs> I'm here to drive the bus and see, check out this, this shit. This is, this is where it's at. I do like, you know, breaker one nine, breaker, breaker one nine. I talk to my friends out on the road. I watch my shows here. When I'm driving, I just, you know, watch The Sopranos. Turning, running. Pat. What's up? What are you doing? I'm just explaining my life on the road. <laughs> what do you feel is lost or gained by your lifestyle? Mm. Well, a lot gained. My lifestyle's really great. I have I have a lot of fun. Um, I get to be creative. What's lost is like an overall sense of health. We've got a crew of, a really great crew of nine people. I mean, you're pretty much roommates with nine people for a month or longer at a time in a long metal tube with not much wiggle room. Living on the bus is all right for a short stints, but after, you know, three weeks, it gets to be a little trying on everybody, I think. What is lost by, or gained? by being on the road. Yeah, just, a, just, your life. just a semblance of normalcy. So when we first got on our first bus, I mean, it was just giddiness. We'd stay up all night, stick our heads out the window. You feel like a big shot. We're really, really excited. It was a small crew then. There was only four of us on that bus, which is kind of wild to think about. Uh, Wesley, Pat, myself, and Ollie. I'm really proud of it. Pulled up to Kansas City. The club was like in sort of a strip mall, and so the bus was parked in the parking lot of the strip mall, kind of for all to see. During the daytime, I think we were all pretty excited, and we all had friends that we wanted to go hang out with. So we all parted ways for hours, and just having fun catching up with people and having quite a few drinks. Now we're on a bus for Big Shots. We got this. See you at the show. So when we all came back together, um, I don't know if I noticed it right off the bat, but as we were kind of getting close to going on stage, I realized looking into each of their beautiful eyes that we're fucking drunk. Like, this is gonna be an issue. Seeing the, sh the, the, the shock and awe on sort of all of our faces, like, what, what have we done? Before the show, sitting in the bus, and there's like a line all the way around the corner, starting to get pretty nervous. It's like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I'm fucking lit. 
And we all go in, we play the show, it's the worst show. A lot of times you have a show and you don't feel great about how you played or something like that, but you could really feel th their confusion and disgust at how bad it was. We didn't even do an encore, people left immediately. I remember asking some friends, like, you know, thanks for coming, I'm really glad, you know, what'd you think of the show? And they're just, yeah, it's, it's good, it's good. And then we had to, then we had to, like, go slink back through the audience. With our heads hanging low to shame bus, we called it. Because we had just gotten the bus, had our first show, and it was just the worst show we've ever played. And that one will always be documented as shame bus. I don't mind it, I, I love touring. It can get hectic, just as far as so many people being jammed in there, but I think we have such a fun crew and everybody's really easy going more than anything. There's really not a lot of bullshit going on um, to make it uncomfortable between everyone. There's always a moment in touring where it starts to wear on you and you start to miss people or you want to sleep in your own bed and you're just like, I don't want to fucking go sound check, you know, whatever. But the reality is, is that we're pretty lucky to be able to be doing this and then having a tour bus just makes everybody a little bit more comfortable. It's, it's a blessing to be on a tour bus. It definitely makes everything a lot easier. Yeah, it really, crazy. It really kind of lights up too. When people start coming in, it's like a, it just basically just starts happening. It feels like just cars just start one way, one way streeting in here. So, I mean, is this where you did um, Can't Wake Up? This is where we started Can't Wake Up. This was kind of, I guess, the beginning of us trying to sort of take excursions to make that record as opposed to making it at my house. So, when we first came out here, we had, I think it was like a week. I think we spent seven-ish days out here. And, uh, and then on the last day, we had just kind of like a public viewing sort of thing. That was actually the first show that I think we ever played with John, pretty sure. Or maybe that was the first time we'd rehearsed the material with him. He showed up, blew my mind. Was he playing piano earlier? Wait, was John playing piano? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Do you think this gave you any kind of vibe to maybe start your studio? Yeah, I mean, certainly in some way. It was, uh, I mean, I guess this is kind of the biggest, most filled out idea of the like home studio where you invite people into it. I mean, that's a, it's a beautiful model to like share food and then share music and share your home. I mean, that's pretty perfect. I gotta throw a rock across this thing, it's fun. It's super fun. Well, what are you trying to do? You know, you, I, I want to give something back or, or make things that are seemingly worth my ticket to ride, so to speak. Because, you know, I think every human wants to feel um, acknowledged in some way, or at least like, like they're adding a little something. Is it a legacy thing or is it like a cultural value thing? Uh, I guess it's a little bit of both. I, I think that for me, the legacy stuff is like, that's a, that's cool. That's a very ideal, I mean, you know, there's still a lot of people that don't even know who Levon is, you know? Or it's like time moves really fast. And then there's some people that like, will never stop mentioning it, like me. But you know, that's the thing, is like legacy can, can be kind of arbitrary, I guess, or it's in the eye of whoever. I, I, I feel like in some ways I've already made more of an impact to, to certain people than I ever expected to, so I'm very pleased about that. But it's like, you know, life, it, <laughs> Life is long, so you gotta do something. I like hearing like vague drumming in the... Woodstock, baby. 
so I think in general that this tour or the way that we set this up, you know, I think it's probably the new standard in a way of us deciding, deciding to stay at a place for multiple days and sort of create a studio on stage, which we had created studios all over the country, uh, but they weren't public viewing spaces, you know? And this was kind of combining uh, our mobile studio idea with kind of takeaway shows where it's being filmed, you know? And then also having that intimate moment and connection with the fans in a very, like, in a way where if they yell something at me, I, 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 the only, they, they know I hear it. So it's like all of these things combined, it, it, it was fun. It felt easy. I never really, this whole tour, like, you know, I always stress a little bit, but this was the lowest that I've worried because I felt like there was n no, there, there was nothing I was beholden to do or nothing I couldn't do that wouldn't be accepted. They were willing to go wherever I wanted to go with them, you know. Over the years, um, in every vehicle that I've toured in, there has always been a moment where I suddenly just get that tingle in the bottom of my feet. You know, like I'm standing on the edge of something. I get this thrill that I'm off, you know, that I'm in the middle of two things. I'm in transit, I'm traveling. And there's something just so comforting about being on the road itself, not at a destination, you know, in between two places. That never goes away. This tour has been great, because I feel like we're finally, you know, bridging the gap between band and, and solo, shaky graves. I think it's cool, but we went very full electric band for this last record and, and tours and everything. So this is the the glue or the, the middle ground that we maybe skipped over. <laughs> Which is awesome, you know? I think it's kind of what we wanted to do and what people have wanted for a while. So it's nice to like see that realized. Having the tape machine on tour has been great. I would do it again. And I'm psyched that we've been able to just make the shows what they are. It, it changes everything, it changes the whole dynamic of being in a room with people. When you see those wheels spinning, you're like, oh, wow, something's going on here. Not traveling after every show really changes the way tour life happens. You get to see the place you're in. You get to actually visit with friends. You get to do all the stuff you don't normally get to do on tour. So more of this. More of this. <laughs> it's, it's super weird that this tape machine is like, it wasn't even the point, you know, we, we weren't going on tour to grab this tape machine. And in a way, it became the centerpiece of it all. And, and like, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very sweet. It's, very, it's super weird. I don't know if it's going to work. I mean, it'll work. Once we drag this thing back in here and install it in the studio, um, <laughs> you know, it could... What's nice is that at the end of this tour, no matter what, now this thing uh, has emotional weight. It, I mean, it's, it has physical weight. It's one of the heaviest <laughs> things I've ever, <laughs> I've ever even attempted to own. But yep. now, since it was there and it, it, it lived on this tour with us, and like, you know, now the tape machine has recorded at Levon Helm's studio. It's, you know, it, it, it was on stage where I was on stage, where, where these big moments happened, you know? The tape machine made an appearance at the Fox Theater, which is the first place I ever played Dearly Departed, you know, the day that I wrote it with Esme. And Esme was there this, this time when we were at the Fox Theater also. So it, it almost, in a way, the tape machine has now lived sort of a small slice of my life with me. You know, we dragged it from place to place. But uh, these are all like not insignificant places. These are all places that mattered a lot in the last 10 years of me traveling. I guess in, in sort of a strange analogy, it's the tour was called the For the Record Tour because we're making stuff for a new record. But I guess it, it's sort of in the sense of like putting something down for the record, like the final word on it, you know, like it being it being the historical document, so to speak. This tape machine now, in a way, like is the document. You know, it 
when I look at it, even if it's just collecting dust in the corner of the studio, I'm gonna remember all the places that we fought it into, every building that we've rolled its huge ass into. <laughs> and in a way, it's a lot like the production that we put on and, and the band and the whole project is sort of this big clunky thing that might not work. But when it does, man, it sure goes, you know? It's like once those big wheels spin, it's, it's, it's forever.
did all, we've always said this is your grace. Make us into it. Awesome.